Hey, hockey fans, welcome to the 7-Eleven Overtime Podcast. I'm your host, Gino Retta. You know, I've spent over four decades working in the game, fortunate enough to meet some of the legends of the game, saw them come into the league, watched them shine in the game, and now they've moved on to life after hockey. The 7-Eleven Overtime Podcast gives us a chance to catch up, tell some stories, relive some great memories, and hear what they're up to today. Today's NHL legend voted as one of the top 100 players of all time, World Cup of Hockey gold medalist, one of only five players in NHL history to skate for all three New York State based teams. Hockey Hall of Famer, Pat LaFontaine. Patty, welcome, my friend. Great to have you with us. Great to be on, Gino. And by the way, I'm one of five, but I'm the only one that's only played for those three teams. Which is very, very impressive. That's very that's true. Of the five, you're the only guy who played for all three. That's Just great. Those three, and, I- and only those three. And I can say, I'm the, and I've said this before jokingly, uh, I'm the only player to be traded twice and never change his license plate. So <laughs> that's, good. that's a good, you know what? I'm going to add that to our list of trivia questions from former <laughs> guests. No one's ever going to get that one. This is great. I think the only other place you can do that in is, is California, right? Because there's only, yeah. there's only one other state that has three teams. So, yeah. um, but, but most of the time you get traded out of your, you know, out of your state, out of your conference. And yeah. uh, for some reason, I was able to stay in New York, um, which was a great, you know, I've become a New Yorker. My wife's from Huntington, Long Island. Our kids are, are born here. So New York became a state. I was born in St. Louis and lived there for seven years. And it was great. Uh, I learned the sport of beginning stages of hockey. My dad was transferred through Chrysler to Michigan. And then I played my minor league hockey in Michigan. And then, you know, went to Montreal at 17, uh, loved it up there at junior hockey for the Verdun juniors and yeah. joined the Olympic team at 18 joined, which was amazing playing for the 84 Olympic team. And then uh, a week later joined the, uh, the New York Islanders and the rest is history, Gino. So. This is great. This is, you just did see in broadcasting and you've been in broadcasting. That's like the headlines. That's the overview of what it all is. And now we get to break it all down. This is great, Patty. You get, you should be full time in, in broadcasting right now and do nothing but that. That's all you should do. <laughs> What are the numbers? I'm leaving it to you guys. No, no, no. Listen, one of my, you talk about the fact you never had to leave New York State. That's because guys didn't want to let you go. American born player, uh, one of the greatest American talents by far in NHL history. And the numbers just tell us that. And you, I mean, the the things you did, the, the thing that stands out to me the most is you got the best points per game by any American born player in NHL history, 1.17 points per game, 15th overall in the NHL, but number one amongst American born players, uh, fifth in goals all time among U S born skaters. It's unbelievable what you have accomplished and yet retired at such a young age. Does it still rip at your heartstrings sometimes thinking if I'd only been healthy enough to play a little bit longer? Well, I, I think you look back and one thing I can say, Gina, is that um, I played to the, to a good friend who's become a good friend, Dr. Kelly um, basically said, you can't play anymore. Yeah. Like I, yeah. I pushed myself as, as long and as hard as I could go. And I was lucky to get 15 years, although a couple of those were years injured. I had my knee reconstructed and I missed yeah. a year because of concussions and ultimately concussions. Uh, I retired. Um, I guess I look at it as gratitude. When you talk about points per game, I I, I'm appreciative to the fact that when I became a New York Islander, Al kind of threw me out there and dangled the carrot and I was able to score, I think 13 goals in my first 15 games. And then um, we went to the Stanley cup finals and a couple of guys named Gretzky and Messier decided it was their turn. Um, The Islanders had swept them the year before four straight. Um, And then we went through a little bit of a rebuilding process. So, um, my first early years were really a fourth line center. And yeah. um, that was Al um, Arbor trying to say to you, you have to learn your craft. Exactly. And, and, and I remember Guy Lafleur went through something similar too. And, oh, yeah. and cause and he was, was trying to come into the league replacing Jean Bellavo. Good luck with that. It, well, yeah. And I had Brian Trache, yeah. uh, Butch Goring and Brent Sutter in front of me and they just won four Stanley cups. But yeah. I have to tell you, um, I'm grateful for that because nothing was handed. Uh, I tell the story. It was my, it wasn't until my second full season, like the last 10 games of the year that Al actually let me take a face off in my own defensive zone. 
And I can tell you, you know, I, I literally never gave him the satisfaction. Remember, I was just turned 19 and I looked about 15 yeah. uh, looking back at some of these pictures. But um, I would go line up in the defensive zone. I mean, I never saw the power play till the end of my second year. Yeah. So it was like, hey, kid, you got to earn it. You got to be a 200 foot player. You got to prove yourself. And it's not going to be given to you. You've got to earn it. Um, yeah. And so I remember never giving him the satisfaction for almost two years. I would go line up in the defensive zone <laughs> and I, and I'd look at the corner of my eye and I'd be like, damn it. Here comes another, you know, yeah. it was trots or it was butchy or it was uh, Brent and I would skate and I wouldn't do anything. And next practice I'd work on my face offs I'd work on my upper body and Gino, I waited two years and then all of a sudden we're in philadelphia late my second year and i go and line up and i'm looking out of the corner of my eye and nobody's coming off and coming out to take me out and i grabbed my stick i turned it up like this and it, i think it was richie sutter it was, it was richie or ronnie and i remember looking i'm like there is no way <laughs> i've waited two years for this moment and i came down so hard i timed that puck it was slow motion and I hit the puck as it landed, and his stick and the puck landed in the back of the corner, flew in the back. And I'm surprised he, you didn't snap your stick. I'm surprised. I'm, I'm lucky I didn't, because maybe I would have never taken a faceoff yeah. again. But uh, but I I won that faceoff, and I ne he never pulled me off again. And what yeah. that told me, Gina, was, kid, nothing comes easy. You've got to earn every inch on the ice. You've got to be a 200 foot player. And the most important face-off is the one in your own zone. Yeah. You got to win it. It's two. So I can tell you, I waited two years for that one draw, but every draw the rest of my career in my defensive zone became the most important draw. And I would bear down because it w wasn't given to me. Yeah. And so what I would say is that generation. So it took me two years to get on the power play. It took, and I had 30 goals that year. I think my yeah. last, two goals were power play goals but it made you appreciate and respect the game and i will tell you this when i retired even though it was a little bit earlier than than i would have hoped uh, i left with gratitude because if something's earned and, and it's hard work and it's kind of delayed gratification you have a deeper appreciation a deeper gratitude for it and i didn't look back like the game yeah. owed me something i looked back and i was grateful for what the game did for me and what it taught me. And so I, I don't, I don't, I really don't have a lot of regret. It would have been nice to stay healthy and play another yeah. five years, but, but I can tell you, I gave everything I had till the doctor said no more. And at that point in time, my wife and my three kids being a father, being a husband, when a doctor tells you, you can't get your head yeah. hit again, that hard, you, you, it's a pretty, it's an easy decision. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so so really more I, I have gratitude for what the game has done and, and having the ability to play at the highest level. I love your determination. And, and I wanted to ask you about this because uh, really in the way it all began for you was the determined nature. By the way, we're in conversation with Hockey Hall of Famer Pat LaFontaine. This is the 7-Eleven Overtime Podcast. I'm Gino Retta. Uh, your determination started really early. You're a 15-year-old kid. You're actually celebrating your 15th birthday and there's something that happens on that day, coincidentally, that potentially determines your fate forever in the game of hockey. Tell that story. Yeah, we were we were celebrating 19, it was 15 February 22nd, 1980. And if you're a U.S. born boy or girl, you were watching Mike Ruzioni score that, you know, miracle on ice goal. Um, we were jumping and you're going to laugh, too, I think. Um, the Illich family will be happy. We had Little Caesars Pizza yeah. for my birthday, and we Good were sponsorship watching. Sponsorship drop there. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> and we were watching the game, and uh, I just remember jumping up and down. And and honestly, uh, when you're a kid born in St. Louis, I lived there. I said till I was seven, and played minor hockey in in, in Michigan. Uh, at that time, if you could get a college scholarship, that was the highest level. Oh, like huge win. There weren't a lot of guys. I think Reed yeah. Larson. Um, there are a few guys playing but it was not a it was not a route and listen nothing against the college getting a college scholarship is fantastic for anybody and their and their career and their life um but that was kind of the ceiling that was the bar yeah. and then all of a sudden 1980 just blew open the doors 
And then guys like uh, Bobby Carpenter were scoring goals and playing well and contributing to the team. Joey Mullen, those guys, you know, deserve so much credit. Joey Mullen, Bobby Carpenter, because then all of a sudden, guys like myself and, and the 80 Olympic team blew the door open. They started realizing, hey, some of these guys are producing. And I ended up leaving to play in, in Verdun at 17. And a lot of back then, all my high school friends were like, what are you, what are you doing? doing? What are you doing? You're going to Canada? He goes, what about the football games on Friday nights? And uh, it's your senior year. We've got, you know, it's going to be so much fun. And I said, no, I, I'm going to go try to play hockey. And, and back then, 1982, I thought I was crazy. But um, yeah. it's one of the best decisions I ever made. And I loved playing in Montreal and the fans. And the Eric Taylor um, was a general manager. And, um, yeah, I've got a great couple of stories. But that was a storybook year. And, and yeah. you know, I'm just – I. Like I said, there the doors were were that night, and then they had people forget they had to beat Finland, Chino, yep, yep. Um, the next day, to which was huge, yeah, four to, four to two, yep. which wasn't a guarantee. Um, but but that just it gave young boys and girls in the United States a chance to dream bigger, and so I'm grateful to those guys because they really opened the door. And what it also did was gave you an appetite to put on the uniform, the Team USA uniform. So you get drafted third overall. You were talking about when you were 17. When you're 18 now, the Islanders draft you third overall. And rather than turn pro right away, you go to Sarajevo for the 1984 Winter Olympic Games. You're just a kid. You get five goals in three games, surrounded by some serious talent. Uh, and, And there's an incident I need you to tell me about. Like, I want to ask you about the Olympics and the experience I'm sure that was. But I guess getting ready for the Olympics, you got locked in a train car in Czechoslovakia. Can you yeah. tell us about that and what yeah. happened? Jeez, I didn't know you knew that. That's a good story. Patty, um, it's my job. I got to know these things. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you're doing good, Gino. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you've heard of stories. I mean, we had Olympic guards when we finally got there. There were armed guards, you know, around the whole Sarajevo Olympic training camp. Um, but along the way, we went to Austria to play Finland in some games and the German team. And, and then we had to take a train to get to Sarajevo, but we were going through Czechoslovakia at the time. And they said, don't worry, the cars are all locked. Uh, we will just be going through a period, a portion in there to get to Sarajevo. And it's the middle of two or three in the morning and the car stops and I, we wake up. And the next thing I know, the doors open up and all these armed guards come in with machine guns. And they told us we weren't supposed to stop. So I, 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 and at that time it was Czechoslovakia wasn't what it is today. And so, you know, I'm, (laughs) I'm using the word grateful because um, we weren't supposed to be stopped there. And uh, I think it kind of, you know, a a few of us were like, our our eyes were wide open and. Well, you were just a kid. I I, I mean, I was just 18, you know, almost, almost 19. And um, we had Eddie Olachek who was 17. David Jensen, who was 17, um, we were young, you know, we were a young team. And, Wasn't your um, line called the diaper line there? We were the, we were the diaper line. <laughs> I was the oldest of the diaper line. But, yeah, um, but, uh, yeah no, that was uh, Gino. That was, I tell that story and people, you know, we were, we were lucky. It was an unscheduled stop in the middle of the yeah. night and armed guards came on and we weren't supposed to stop. So, But you got through it okay. You went on, you got to play at the Olympic Games, you got a chance to, to wear the, the American colors, which were spectacular. And then just a few days later, you're in the National Hockey League. And you well, look around to... at the guys who suddenly you have teammates there. I'll tell you the story, Gino. I was, my, in 1980, we, obviously the gold medal was in February. Yeah. And in May, my dad's like, hey, you guys, go out and do some spring cleaning. And we were always working, my brother and I. And we were raking leaves and then he called us in. He said, Hey, come on in. The, 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 they're in overtime. And uh, I, I didn't even know at the time it was on national TV, but it was the Islanders and the Flyers. So it was 1980. So sure enough, we come in and I'm watching. And before I know it, Henning passes it to Tonelli, Tonelli to Nystrom, base core, and yeah. Bobby's jumping up and down. And, you know, I, I within February to May, a 15 year old kid said, wow, if I could ever play for the Olympics and maybe, maybe have a chance to play pro, how cool would that be? Now, the irony was literally three and a half years later, 
uh, in March, um, I line up after the Olympics and I look to my right and it's Bobby Nystrom. I look to my left, it's John Tonelli. <laughs> Those are, that was my starting line. So if you told me three and a half years earlier, after watching them win the Stanley cup and the, the, the Olympics, the U S winning the gold. And you thought, I would have thought, you know, you're crazy. Yeah. And, and here I was centering those two guys and uh, I'll never forget our second game um, in Toronto at Maple Leaf Gardens. Uh, we end up winning 11 to six. Somehow I get my first goal. My dad is a Maple Leaf fan. I was a Canadian Sabres fan because I loved uh, Guy Lafleur and Gilbert Perot were my idols. And my dad drove up and I was able to score my first goal and somehow get a hat trick that night. Couple I was going to say, not just your first goal. <laughs> you had a <laughs> hat trick. And our second game, and I think Bobby, myself, and Nye, Bobby Nye, were all uh, first star, you know, first, second, third stars. And I'll never forget this because even though it was a big night offensively, uh, Al comes in, he kicks, he kicks the uh, gar uh, the garbage can over, and he you know, yells at us for giving up six goals. And uh, but there was something that happened in the third period. Uh, I think it was Jim Corn came in and sla hit me, slashed me, and I, I kind of went back at him. And then Bobby Nystrom came in and charged him. And here I am, just 19, in the penalty box. It's my first penalty in the National Hockey League. And I'm, I'm basically saying Mr. Nystrom, Mr. Gillies. And he just said, kid, don't ask any questions. Go straight to the bench. So Whoa. I didn't say a word. Bobby meets Jim Corn at center ice. And it's the fight where Don Cherry says um, he threw 22 punches to one. And, and, and before I get to the bench, I see Trotz, Clarkie, everybody standing up. So I didn't even, I just turned around and, and Bobby had gone toe to toe and switched right to left uppercuts. And I, yeah. and I 22 punches to one. And, <laughs> and I saw my dad right after the game. And uh, the first thing he said, he, went, he didn't say congratulations <laughs> on your first goal. He just said, now you know why these guys win. Yeah. And here it was the first time somebody took liberties, you know, Bobby Nystrom, Clarky. I mean, the character on that team was off the charts. And, yeah. you know, what a lucky thing for me as a 19 year old kid to watch and play with these guys. Flats and I, both Pat Flatley and myself, yeah. we learned so much in that short period of time just playing with those guys. Um, and I'll never forget it. I mean, yeah. it was the night I got three goals, two assists. But I remember Bobby Nystrom sticking up and 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 you know doing protecting his teammates, and wow. um, it just showed me why they won four cups. That's a great story. I, I've never heard it from that angle before. I, I mean, obviously, I remember your five point nine and your hat trick, but I didn't realize uh, the impact that that had on you. And and uh, your transition to the NHL was totally seamless. You had thirteen goals in your first fifteen NHL games, um, thirty or more goals for eight straight seasons, six. 40 plus goal seasons, 250 goal seasons, eight years, six times you went to the playoffs, an incredible run on your time with the New York Islanders. And I got to ask you about a story that I still remember. And I was a, a young kid in broadcasting at that point, the 1987 Stanley cup playoffs. Everybody asks you about this. I'm sure the Easter Epic. Yeah. Um, you guys are playing the caps opening round game seven. It became the longest game seven in NHL history, started Saturday night, didn't finish till Sunday at 2 a.m., fourth overtime. Walk us through the way it all ended, for those who don't know the end of the story. Well, Gino, it was obviously one of the goals I'll always remember, but um, we were down three games to one. And back then, I think there was only one other team that came back. It never came back, yeah. So, so it was kind of, you know, it happens now more frequently, but it wasn't back then. So it was kind of a big mountain and somehow we came together as a team and we just chipped away, won that second game. Then we won the third game at home, forced the game seven. We had the momentum, flat scores with the Washington scores, flat scores. And then Trot scores a big goal with five minutes to go in the third period. And then it's, it's on, and I'll never forget Kelly Rudy, Kelly Rudy, it, it was like both he and Bob Mason were seeing beach balls oh, coming out. Yeah. Because anything they everything. saw, they were saving. Yeah. I mean, it's one of the most incredible goaltending performances uh, in the history of the game. And, um, and I'll remember coming out every first five to seven minutes, we were gangbusters. 
It's a good thing um, if they had to call penalties today, Chino. <laughs> I mean, guys Different would have been era. in the box because yeah. we were just yeah. holding on. Yeah. And then by the time we get to the fourth overtime, and I remember asking for oxygen. I found out later one of the guys, because Miko Makla and the guys, we were, we were just holding, having the oxygen. And I think one of their, their trainers got in trouble because they found out later that we asked for it. But we would sit with our legs up and we would have, you know, at that time there was orange, you know, orange peels and, and um, just cut up oranges to, yeah. to help out. So, I mean, you're talking 1987. So finally we get to the fourth overtime. It's halfway through. And I'll never forget this. I'm watching Bobby Bassin because you're you're kind of like you're so locked in. And I'm only watching Bassin. I'm watching what's going on because he's my guy. Yeah. And Jimmy Pickard, our great, the great late Jimmy Pickard, love, love the guy. He said, hey, Pop, he's coming. Pop, Pop, you're going to get one. I can feel it. And he takes a water bottle, squeeze it down the back of my neck because everyone, I mean, we were just wiped out. It's yeah. almost two o'clock. Oh, yeah. You played over two full games. Oh, two full games. I think Clark he said he lost twelve pounds that that Doesn't game. Surprise me at all. I mean, it, yeah, it was. And uh, so, at that moment, Jano, you know, they start playing music from the Twilight Zone. <laughs> so I heard da na 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 na, and I I literally took it was probably about thirty seconds, and I'm seventy five shots to fifty seven. It's two o'clock in the morning, and I look, and there are people sleeping in the stands, like. Sleep. You didn't really see. I've heard that you said that, but that you no, didn't no, really no. See they were. Sleeping. I I saw sleeping. There was a couple of people. It's two o'clock in the morning. If you brought a child to that game, he's he or she's probably sleeping. So, and I'm I'm just kind of have a moment where is this really happening? It was like a surreal, like everything slowed down, and here comes Bobby Basson. And sure enough, I jumped over, and I was covering because Gord Deneen took the puck and he pinched along the right side, and Kenny Leiter was the other defenseman. So obviously I'm thinking cover for Gordy. I'm the last forward in because Bobby Basson just came off and Gordonine is pinching down low. He cuts around the net. I said, I'm, I'm staying, I'm covering for Gordy. And sure enough, he, he comes around, throws it and it hits, I think Rod Langway stick or Kevin, uh, one of the Hatcher brothers stick. And it comes out to me in a weird way where it's on my backhand. Yeah. And I have to tell you, Gino, I've never shot a puck like that in my life. I haven't to this day, just the one time. And I spun around and I just, and it was on, it was rolling. And I'm just yeah. like, I, I don't have time. I got to shoot it anyway. I can't stop it. So I just spun around and just hit it. And I said, please hit the net or something. And I heard the post and then everything stopped again for a second. Yeah. And then people don't know this, but Bob Mason was my teammate in, in the Olympic team. He was the That's backup right. yeah. goalie behind Mark Barron. Yeah. So, so it hits, and I'm looking at Mace, and next thing I know, I see him drop. And then it was like whatever we had left of and adrenaline, and, and we just – it all came out because yeah. it took a moment to realize that the game was actually over. And uh, you know what? It was a team – it was just a team that hung together. Terry Simpson did a great job coaching that team. Bobby Nystrom was the assistant coach at the time too, but we just had a belief. That was something about the Islander way. You just had a belief that someone was going to be a hero. Someone was going to score a goal. And honestly, I never shot a puck like that again. I'm thankful that it was on edge because it probably dipped a little bit because I know of Bob Mason and then Dale Henry was screening the goalie, which was a huge, if it wasn't for Dale Henry in front of the net. So um, there's one of those things, but, but people forget we actually got home it was, I got to the house at 7 a.m. because we had to wait for the bus and then we had to go to Landover. We had to wait for the plane. Then we had to be directed into LaGuardia, I was believed. And we finally took the bus back to the Coliseum. We drove home. It was Easter morning. I got in at 7 a.m., um, woke up around noon and went to mass because it was Easter Sunday. Yeah. Went back to bed, got up, oh, excuse me here, got up around, um, got up around uh five o'clock had something to eat caught uh, drove down caught the bus to go to philly to play the next night and we took them to seven games yeah. so yeah yeah Crazy. sorry <laughs> i gotta tell you patty to hear you tell the story from your angle like that it makes the hairs on the back of my neck stand i still remember watching the game because we all stayed up to watch it there's no way we were not going to watch it because you knew you were watching history unfold 
And it just makes the hair stand on the back of my neck to find out all the stuff that was going on behind the scenes. Wow. In conversation with Hockey Hall of Famer, uh, the legend himself, one of the greatest of all time, Pat LaFontaine. This is the 7-Eleven Overtime Podcast. I'm your host, Gino Retta. A lot of great years, a lot of great experiences on the island. Then you had a couple of unbelievable, magical years with the Buffalo Sabres where, where I remember the numbers that you put together. Uh, your first year with the Sabres, you only played 52 games with them. But your numbers in that 52-game season were off the charts. I mean, 46 goals, 93 points in just 57 games in your first season with the Sabres. And then your second season was even better when you played with Andrew Chuck and McGillney. You had 53 goals, 148 points. That was a personal best for you, a franchise best. And amongst your 95 assists, you have to Alexander McGillney put together a 76 goal season. What were those two years like for you, your first two in Buffalo? Oh, they were, I mean, they were, they were special years because it was really the chemistry. Um, uh, I'll tell you a great story about Alex. Um, when I first went there, Alex carried the puck all the time and they were worried about him as, you know, and I can tell you that he got in front of everybody and kind of, he had to hold on to the puck. He had to dump it or hold it to wait for everybody to kind of catch, catch up, up to him. <laughs> yeah. And um, this is coming from one of the fastest guys who ever played the game <laughs> in Pat Lafonte. <laughs> well, I, I can tell you blue line to blue line. There's not a faster skater I've ever seen. His first four strides, he was at full speed at that fourth stride and blue line to blue line. I've never seen anybody faster. Yeah. He just had a turbo in him. And there's there's three guys, Gino, that I say that that in my mind I can remember. There's probably more, but that can actually score. Their hands are as quick as their feet and they can score a goal going full speed. Yeah. Like It's very hard to think about. I mean, think about skating the fastest you can skate and yet have a puck on your hand and be able to, to your hands keep up with your feet. Yeah. And McDavid's one of them. Yeah. I would say McGillney and probably Bure. Yeah. And it's a small list because I'm saying, a very short I'm list. saying yeah. all out skating and then your hands are able to keep up with your feet. But I remember going to Alex and we got to know each other real well, obviously. And uh, Alex is a great guy. And uh, I said to him one practice, because I watched him for a little while and I just said, Alex, listen, you're carrying the puck all the time through the blue lines. I said, I said, give it to me and go. I will find you. I said, you need to trust the fact that I will find you. And I, and I said, we will give and go play off of each other. And I mean, I used to watch the, you know, Steve Shutt and you know, Lafleur do it all. I mean, it was all about the, no one's faster than the puck. Yeah. And um, so I said, then when we get in the offensive zone, I said, you know, there are areas I know you like to go, but I said, you don't shoot the puck enough. I said, you, I'm telling you, you go here. And we, we both agreed on three or four places, mainly three that he loved to go to. And I said, I will find you. I said, I will find you. You need to trust. But I said, do me this favor. You have to shoot the puck more. You've got one of the best shots I've ever seen, but you rarely use it. So he said, oh, okay, buddy. Okay, buddy. And <laughs> <laughs> so he practiced all of that. And then he skated away. Uh, and I said to him right before he skated away, I said, Alex, if you do this, I'm telling you, I'll guarantee you'll score at least 50 goals. And he, he lit up and then wow. he skated, he skated away, Gino. And I turned to Jim Pizzatelli, the trainer. And I said, pizza, if he does this, he could score 70. And he goes, no, no, nobody's scoring 70. He's <laughs> like, he, to this day, he still shook his head. Sure enough. Alex did it. And then here's the beauty of that line. We are very lucky. I mean, John Buckler put us together and the chemistry just hit. But but then you've got Dave Anderchuk, who's got this amazing ability in front of the net. I mean, he's, Phil Esposito was the last great guy in front of the net, could tip yeah. pucks, and they used to call him garbage goals, but he yeah. was brilliant. Dave Anderchuk, people don't, I mean, his oh, He was skating, a moose in front of the net. So think about it. Alex and I would just take off. It was give and go. We'd take off. And here comes Dave coming in. Third, right in the slot or right in front of the net, causing traffic, tipping pucks, shooting pucks. Um, that year, Alex scored 76. And that year was pretty special in the fact that, I mean, Fierzy, I love Fierzy. We traded for Fierzy. Yeah. We got Grant in March of that deal. But do you know, Gino, this is another interesting one. 
if we would have, if you prorated Andrew Chuck McGillany and myself, we were the only line in the history of sports and the NHL to score all have 50 goals. Wow. That's, uh, it, yeah. that's never happened. Yeah. And people forget, you've always had this one, two punch, Gretzky, yeah. Curry, you know, you bossy Trottier, but there's never been a line in the history of, of hockey that all three guys, and that would have been the first. Yeah, that but in the end, we ended up trading um, Andy uh, Andrew Truck. He went yeah. to uh, Toronto, scored fifty five. Yeah, and then obviously we swept the Bruins in the first round, and uh, Grant ended up getting hurt in his knee, but he helped us. And then a guy named uh, Hasek came yeah, in behind. That guy did okay, so pretty good. But <laughs> but that that those years in Buffalo, uh, they're so memorable. There's so much fun to play on a line like that um, that just clicked, and then. Yuri Hemlev came in and filled in for for uh, Dave Anderchuk when we traded yeah. him, and Yuri Yuri did a great job. But but the way we played the the tempo, I think it was kind of mimicking the Oiler days. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was. You you really were a part of changing the way we we did things on the ice, the way we will watch the game. And one of the other parts, and you you alluded to this right off the top, so I want to revisit it because I think it's an important issue. Is way before we understood concussions, way before we understood. Um, the impact it could have and how serious we needed to take them. You were kind of at the foreground of that. Just for, for our audience who maybe doesn't know the background, your first major concussion was back in the playoffs in 1990. Uh, you got hit by James Patrick of the Rangers, taken to hospital by ambulance is that, but we didn't understand what it was about. Then in the 96, 97 season, you got hit by Francois Leroux, big six foot, six inch guy, and your helmet came loose. And it was part of the the rule change that we, you know, said guys have to make sure their helmets are secure now. And you actually hit your head on the ice. Um, it was awful. It was awful to to see you on the ice, an, an unconscious, and we didn't understand what was going on. Um, and yet you just kept wanting to come back. And the Sabres were saying, no, like, it's not safe for you to come back. Walk us through what that was like for you, because you, your incredible passion you had for the game, but you also, you know, you, you had a family. You you were going to have a life after hockey. How difficult was that for you in that time? Oh, that was a real tough time, obviously, because um, kind of got blindsided there, and I was already concussed, and I had my helmet on tight. And it had popped off. And as you said, it was kind of a double whammy because then my forehead had um, slapped on the ice afterwards, which, you know, probably did as much or more damage having two concussions probably in a short period of time, as we know. Yeah. Um, but I actually, it was a little bit of a delayed onset of the symptoms. And it was a week later I played and I had... Um, come off and I had a really bad migraine and I had come back to tell the doctors and the trainers and and my first year I had broken my jaw so I had a, a, to deal with TMJ so um, what I will tell you Gino was I was actually cleared to play and I played those I think five games and yeah. um, as each game went by it got really strange and harder to even play and it wasn't until uh, the last game against Philadelphia where I took the face off and then everything was just going too fast. I, it, it scared me. It's actually the first time I ever got scared. And I remember after the game standing up, I was a little emotional telling the guys, you know, as a captain, I got to play better. And I wasn't really understanding what was going on. And um, Ted Nolan had called me in the next morning and he just said, something, something's not right. Um, he said, I don't, I don't think you should, I don't think you should be playing. Uh, I'm not going to, I don't care what anyone says. You, you, something's not right. And I, when he told me, I, you know, you're not going to play. Um, I, I got emotional because I, I couldn't control that. I didn't know what was happening to me. Things were kind of coming apart. And the team sent me to the Mayo Clinic um, a couple of days later. And after seeing the doctors, um, every one of them just said, um, you know, what were you doing playing hockey? You know how lucky you are you didn't get hit. I had some uh, minor swelling in my right frontal lobe in my brain. So I shouldn't have never been playing, but I but I was. Um, but, but the good thing that came out of that, Gino, was that a year later, the Sabres and the, and the NHL realized that, you know, we were still learning about concussions. Yeah. Yeah, um, 
but from that <clears throat> from that concussion um baseline testing across the league came out of that yeah. um larry quinn was the president at the time and they obviously realized that you know, something fell through the cracks here we should have should have never been playing uh, and I, every doctor at the Mayo Clinic said, you know how lucky you are you didn't get hit during that period of time because you had swelling in your right frontal lobe. So, so the good news is I was able, and then once I let go, I went into kind of the six months where it took me six months post-concussion, you know, kind of a deep depression and yeah. uh, things got a little strange. I mean, I can understand uh, the, the darkness you go through. Um I was lucky I got plugged back in and I had a chance to come back and play. And that's where Dr. Kelly stepped in. But, um, but the good news is, is I think we, we continue to learn. We continue to try to make it safer. We continue to try to make it better for the next generation because nobody should have to go through that. And guys have had to retire, and, you know, myself included. And obviously, you know, guys that come to mind, Eric Lentros and, and Paul Correa, and, and there's a number of guys, Mark Savard. So, so, as long as we learn from it, we're better for it. We're more protective. Um, I actually just recently worked on putting together um, a really cool dynamic safe helmet that I'm going to bring uh, bring out here soon that I think will be good for prevention. Because as we all know, you can't um, you can't stop a concussion, no. yeah. but you you can minimize the damage and you can make it better. And so, um, you know, it's put me on that path to try to find a way to give back and try to say, how do we, how do we be better? How do we make it safer? And how can we learn? And, um, you know, that's where I give the league and I give, you know, the, the, the general managers, trainers, doctors, you know, there's, there's a constant effort to make it safer, make it better for, for the next generation. Yeah. And, um, you know, we, we learned a lot during those days. Yeah. Patty, you went through in your own words, a, a very serious time of depression. You went through like serious scare. Uh, from a health standpoint, how are you today? How are you battling on both uh, your your battles against depression and your physical situation with the concussion, the issues that you had in the past? How are you today? Yeah, no, good. I'm, you know, I'm lucky. I have no residual effects. Um, I can tell you if it's a really humid day where where I had the migraine headaches every day for three months, I can tell you if it's humid. But um, I've been very lucky. Uh, I went through post-concussion syndrome twice for six months, both times. Um, the second one wasn't as bad as the first one, yeah. uh, but uh, I'm fully recovered and really no residual. I'm, I'm grateful, again, I'll use that word, that uh, Dr. Kelly and I got the right support and the right advice at the right time because another hit you know, may not have been the case. And, and as hard as it was to retire and let go of a, a sport you loved, um, there was also a bit of me that was relieved because I didn't want to be responsible to make that decision. Yeah. It's hard to let go of something you love so much, but, um, looking back now, what a great, you know, it was the right decision. And I'm a grandfather. Now I have a, a two and a half year old grandson. His name's Patrick. Also my son's awesome. Daniel Patrick. He named his son, Patrick Daniel. And, uh, you know, um, the three, you know, great kids and a son-in-law and a daughter-in-law and um, lucky and blessed with my wife. And so, you know, that was all about that decision was to make sure that if I, if I did go back the first time that I wasn't going to put that in jeopardy. I'm, I'm a husband and a father way before after 15 years of hockey. And it, and it made it the decision easy because you just don't, you don't want to mess with that. Mm -hmm. um, it was a great, the doctor said to me, it was a great line. He said, Pat, you're not going to understand the decision you made till a couple of years down. And he goes, let me tell you a story. I was out in Coronado where they were flying the fighter jets. And um, there's a bunch of guys flying at hundred feet, going 700 miles an hour, a hundred feet off the beach. And then there's one guy that's coming later. He's going 300 miles an hour and he's about 300 feet and he said, uh, and I said, okay, who's that? He goes, oh, that's the captain. He doesn't need to fly at 700 feet, 100 miles above the ocean anymore. And a couple of years down the road, you'll understand what I mean. And um, I did. I, I remember going to a game, Gino. And I remember going in the corners with guys like Buka Boom and Bork and thinking, okay, I'm coming out of the corner, Stevens. I'm going to knock you down. I'm getting the puck. I mean, that, that was the mindset. Yeah. But then actually to sit there a couple of years later and think, I mean, I, 
we do it all over again. We love the sport. You make the sacrifice. It's what you love to do. But when you're flying at 300 feet, going 300 miles an hour and not 700 miles an hour at 100 feet, you look at things a little differently. Yeah. And uh, you just don't need to do that anymore. But you think, yeah, I used to do that. That's a little crazy. <laughs> but uh, but that was your mindset, yeah. right? And uh, I wouldn't change it. Um, but at the same instance, I knew it was time uh, to move on and to you know, get passionate and excited about something else. Um, and the good news is, is the game of hockey lives inside you long after it's over. Yeah. Um, the camaraderie, the teamwork, uh, the life lessons, the character development, all of that stuff I use every day, getting knocked down, getting back up, you know, uh, sacrifice, discipline, you know, hard work, all the stuff that you learn in the great game of hockey, it lives inside of you long after it's done. Wow. Patty, Thank you so much. Uh, I just, um, a lot of times in this podcast, I'm the interviewer. Now I'm just kind of the listener with you. <laughs> I We so appreciate you telling us these stories. Um, the impact that you had on the game as a player, the impact you had on U.S. hockey, and 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 I think in a very real way, the impact you had on our, our understandings of, of player safety moving forward. It's, it's invaluable. It's part of what's made you a hockey hall of famer we're so glad you're doing so well thank you for taking all this time to share these amazing stories it has been amazing catching back up with you again my friend you too thanks so much Gene. anytime hockey hall of famer legend pat lafontaine the overtime podcast is proudly presented by 7-eleven before leaving the rink order your favorite slurpee fresh 100 premium arabica coffee Hot from the oven, pizza and wings, a pint of ice cream, or even a carton of milk, eggs, loaf of bread from the 7Now app. And Team 7-Eleven will have your order ready for pickup 24-7. Hey, if you missed any parts of the show, don't worry. Visit our website at theovertimepodcast.ca, where you can both listen to and subscribe to future shows. 7-Eleven's Overtime Podcast can be found on the iHeartRadio app, Spotify, iTunes Podcasts, or any of your favorite podcast platforms. Until next week, I'm Gino Retta saying so long, hockey fans. And thanks for joining us on the 7-Eleven Overtime Podcast.